to start. We have one of our wonderful panelists just uh, coming out shortly. If um, we were joking earlier, but it's true, if you don't have a seat, you're in a furniture store. So <laughs> you'll be able to find somewhere comfortable to rest. <laughs> like, to lie down on the bed, if you'd like. Hi. Okay, wonderful. So um, I was going to start by saying happy National Infertility Awareness Week, but I don't, it's a funny thing to say happy. With that, but what I am happy about is seeing all of you because uh, this is our first public event uh, with Pregnantish. We launched just over two months ago, and thank you. And um, I was told by a few people when I said we wanted to do live events, people don't come out to live events. They don't want to talk about infertility and fertility. Um, you could do it in a doctor's office with a few people. They're not going to come to a live event. We not only reach capacity, we're over capacity. I think that's a great sign. I think that means that we're, we're ready to be open. Our tagline at Pregnantish is real talk about fertility. Part of my mission, some of you know, is to break the taboo of infertility. It's affecting about one in eight. Nothing to be ashamed of, especially for so many of us. It's a medical issue. And for those who are uh, not in a heterosexual couple, if you're single on the journey or you're part of our LGBT group that we're addressing also on Pregnantish, you if you're not pursuing adoption and you want to have a family or you're not fostering, you're going to be pursuing fertility treatments. So this is an issue affecting millions of people. And uh, we want to just stay true to this Real Talk mission today with this panel, navigating your relationships with fertility. Before I introduce the lovely participants on the panel, um, those of you, some of you know me, I'm a relationship author. And I'm out there in the media always sharing relationship advice. And people have said to me when I launched Pregnantish, oh, so you've moved on from the relationship thing? And I said, it's, it's a funny thing, but fertility is related to relationships and sex, believe it or not. <laughs> so <laughs> it's not actually different. It's amazing. It's actually an extension of that. Um, I am, anyway, so I'm so happy to see you in the room tonight. We're going to have a really open conversation. I want to thank our event partners who have been big supporters of Pregnantish. Um, we have Peri per I always pronounce your name wrong. Pariah. Pariah Vine from Cellmatics. And we're really excited to hear from you tonight about um, how you're making major breakthroughs with the science of fertility. And we have a wonderful partner, Dr. Lucy Hutner from Union Square Practice, who's a reproductive psychiatrist. We have a reproductive endocrinologist, Dr. Joseph uh, Davis. And um, I also want to thank Faring Pharmaceutical. They are a wonderful partner as well, and, and some of their um, colleagues are here in the room tonight, and uh, in the gift bags you'll get at the end of the evening, you'll see materials from our partners. Um, and also, that's what the ticket, just a brief note, the ticket will redeem a gift bag for the women in the room, and it's full of self-care products. And the reason is because I think, you know, it's this big beef I have that mommy bloggers, <laughs> Oh, but this, mommy bloggers are great, don't get me wrong, but they, you know, I go to these events sometimes, I'm invited as a relationship writer, and it's like they're given a lot of really wonderful pampering products, and those of us who want to be moms right. are going through our own hard thing, right? And we kind of need to be pampered too, and we need to focus on self-care too. So in the bag, just quickly, I wanted to call out, um, and I, I wrote it down so I won't miss anyone, I wanted to call out some of the, the, the items you'll see in there because they're really wonderful. We have uh, jewelry by Rush. Not all, not all of you will get this bracelet, but some of you will. Um, pretty nail polish. This is organic nail polish in our Pregnantish colors. If you see the Pregnantish logo, it's slightly off blue, slightly different than pink. Um, high Street soaps. This is artisanal soap. Batiste dry shampoo. Glam Squad makeup cards. And uh, what am I missing? Lavender. Lavender. We have lavender from this wonderful lavender farm on Long Island. And actually, I've started taking the little lavender packet that you guys are going to get to fertility appointments when I'm stressed and I need to just center and be relaxed. 
I smell it and, it, and it instantly puts me in that mode. So without further ado, I want to actually introduce the wonderful health editor at Red Book Magazine, Karen Snyder Duke, who will be moderating this panel and actually make another quick introduction. Um, Karen, uh, you know, wonderfully, like, signed up right away to be part of this panel and let, it, let me know that Red Book has been a, a big advocate of supporting people in through infertility. And you actually won an award last year, right, for that coverage? Yeah, we won uh, the 2016 Na National Health Information Awards. Our uh, most recent feature on infertility placed gold in that. Um, and it was an incredible, incredible five-page five feature on the sort of the financial difficulties that the couples face when they're going through infertility and how common that is and how much that really needs to change, that we need to support them, not just on a local level, but also on a federal level. So it was really, um, it was really, really rewarding work, and we talked a lot about the stress and everything involved with that, too. Which, so we really appreciate that at Red Book Magazine. Um, so I'll, I'll throw it to you, Karen. Thank you again. Thank you. Hi, everybody. So now that she's introduced all the panelists, we'll go ahead and go through and, and yeah, it's okay. Talk okay. Okay. She's introduced all the panelists, and so I'll go through and just kind of get started, and we'll see where the conversation leads. I have a lot of questions, and I know that you all have a lot of questions, so we'll make sure that we leave some time for you at the end, too. Um, but I'll sort of start with Piraya. Piraya, sorry. Did I? Piraya. Pariah, sorry. Um, so I, I think that the most, that maybe a good starting point is to sort of dig into the biology and the science of fertility, and certainly Dr. Davis, if you want to weigh in on this too, when she's done, that would be great. So I wanted to see first if you could tell us a little bit more about what you do at Salmatix and why you created Fertilome and a little bit more about it specifically. Sure. Okay, great. Um, well, thank you, Andrea, for having us here. Um, so I was trained as a PhD molecular geneticist, uh, focused on the biology of what it takes to make a high quality egg in a mammal, and have that egg be fertilized and then implant in the mother. And um, what I had done before I did that was I worked in the cancer field on personalized medicine. And this is a paradigm where you don't just make a treatment decision based on like a high level diagnosis like a brain tumor or ovarian cancer, but you really use genetics to understand on a very personalized level to that tumor, to that individual, what is going on biologically, so that you might actually end up treating a brain cancer and a colon cancer the same way. Because under the hood, biologically, what's gone wrong with those cells may be the same. And so I got to see the very earliest days of personalized medicine uh, grow up in, in the oncology field. And then when my scientific journey took me into fertility and the genetics of fertility, um, I realized that nobody um, was really working, you know, there was some government funding going to do, doing some interesting genetic studies, but no one was really working on bringing personalized medicine to the clinic, creating a test that a physician could actually hold, test, and use to guide treatment decisions. And more broadly, that I didn't see it really, um, you know, en route to impact women's health more generally either. And so um, I founded Cellmatics to bring personalized, women, uh, personalized medicine to women's health. And we focused on fertility because one of the things that we know is that um, over 90% of women in the U.S., according to the CDC, want to have a child one day. And a majority of those women expressed in the CDC study, and then later we've shown this in our um, research as well, that they are worried that when it comes time for them to have a baby, they may struggle. And I think part of it is because of the kind of awareness that is being brought to women that, you know, fertility isn't always the default setting. <coughs> you know, kind of your whole life you focus on not getting pregnant until it's time and then you're like, okay, <laughs> reactivate the default setting and then you're like, wait a minute, it didn't happen the first month, it didn't happen the first year, what is going on, right? And so what that has done is it's brought greater awareness, but it's also brought greater anxiety to women. Women are making decisions using age really as one of the main metrics. I'm starting to get older, I'm getting closer to 30, now I'm getting closer to 35. We have women in our data sets who went into menopause in college. Um, we have women who went into menopause and the pill masked that because they had regular periods for a long time. And when they reactivated the default setting, it was too late. And maybe <coughs> age-wise, they were fine. They were 29, they were 30, and they said, wait a minute, I've been going to the OBGYN every year religiously. How could this have happened? I was being proactive about my health. How could I just wake up and have infertility? And so it was really important to us to decode that. And um, just with that long intro, just to give you the background of how I got into this as a scientist and as a woman, 
what we've learned subsequently since I left my academic track and I founded Cellmatics eight years ago and partnered with some of the best fertility centers, including RMA of New York, who was one of our earliest partners. Um, and uh, what we've learned is that, um, you know, of the 20,000 genes that our DNA encodes, about a quarter of them, in some way, shape, or form, has been linked to fertility. Right? Which is a huge number, that a quarter of your coding information in your DNA um, is in some way impacting your fertility. But then if you think about it, um, it's not that surprising because there's so much, especially in a woman's body, that goes into not only making an egg, but getting through all of the process of, of getting to the end of a successful pregnancy. And so, so that feels like intractable, like, oh my god, if it's a quarter of your genes, how are you ever going to get to the bottom of it and make that clinically useful? But the other thing we learned by partnering with RMA of New York and other great institutions who are helping couples and women who are struggling um, to conceive or to maintain a pregnancy is that even though there's thousands of things that have to go right, there's actually only a handful of things that commonly go wrong in women who are struggling to conceive. There are some kind of you know, pressure points biologically, if you will, that if this isn't going right, then you're gonna struggle. And struggling for you might mean that you go into menopause earlier, it might mean that you have issues with egg quality. It might mean that you make it to an embryo fine, but your body has trouble allowing that embryo to take hold or to grow and flourish. And so what we did was um, we developed and, and launched in January the first genetic test. It's a multi-gene testing panel called the Fer Fertilum Genetic <coughs> Test. Um, and what it does is it, it tests for these common um, pressure points, if you will, in the genome that if you have alterations in these particular genes, it means that your biology in, in uh, the biological processes that those genes are important for is a little different than the average woman. So your journey is going to be a bit rockier. It doesn't mean you're not ever going to have a child, but it means it's, it's, you have a higher risk of having recurrent pregnancy loss or having a diagnosis like endometriosis or having early menopause. And so what's so important about that is that one of the things that has emerged in the science is that just like there are these common um, kind of genes, there are common biological things that could go wrong. So women can have differences in how follicles develop in their ovary, and that can influence um, their fertility. They can have differences in their immune system, right? And this is something, the analogy I like to make about the immune system is that, um, you know, everyone knows that even in families, people, if a, a flu goes across a family, not everyone's going to get sick in the same way, right? Um, and, and those are people who are potentially genetically very closely related. They could be siblings, right? And yet they could have a very different response to that virus or to that vaccine. And so we know as well that those immunological differences can impact a, a number of things. Um, the other thing, the other analogy that I like to make about what biologically can go wrong um, has to do with hormone metabolism. So we metabolize, we make our own hormones from the things that we eat, right? And then those hormones impact um, virtually every um, organ in our body. And not surprisingly, there's a lot of differences that can happen in, in that process. And so one person can eat the same diet as somebody else and they can have hormonal, very different hormonal consequences for one woman versus another, right? And for this um, you know, example, I like to say, everybody has that friend who no matter what they eat, they are always skinny, right? And everybody has that friend who they've been dieting as long as you've known them and they've never lost a pound, right? And so the reality is those two women can be eating the same thing, but it can be impacting their hormone metabolism, their weight, their biology very differently. And so what Fertilum does for the first time is it allows us to start moving for our area of focus for fertility and reproductive health, which ultimately impacts every aspect of women's health. Um, it allows us to start moving and for the first time bring personalized medicine into the picture. Um, so anyway, so that's a little bit about the biology. Interesting. Um, so to, to sort of piggyback on that question, if for those of us who maybe haven't started treatments yet or as familiar with the process as you're going in, how does Fertilone differ from the standard range of tests that you tend to get done in, in the early stages of your treatments? Um, so, so those tests are what we at Cellmatics call clinical tests. So those are things where a doctor might do a physical examination, might use an ultrasound machine to look um, at certain things internally may look at your hormone levels, right? And that's a snapshot in time of what you are in that moment, right? What it often doesn't tell you is biologically what's happening under the hood, right? So they may be able to say you have polycystic ovaries, right? That's a clinical diagnosis. Um, you have elevated FSH and, and lower AMH as a clinical observation, right? Um, they can't tell you why it happened. 
Um, they can't tell you if maybe there's a very different reason why it happened in you versus somebody else, right? Um, and so having that biological insight, we have found now that um, in, in, the, in the past we were talking in theory what it could in theory do, but now that it's in use for the last few months, what we know is that it's allowing physicians to um, not see someone as a cookie cutter. So for example, we had um, one patient story where she came in, she had a partially blocked tube, and she had PCOS as her clinical diagnosis. And so the physician said, slam dunk, you've come to the right place, you are very high prognosis for IVF. And what happened was everything that could have gone wrong in her cycle went wrong across multiple cycles. And when we did a fertile limb panel on her, we realized that there were a lot of things going on under the hood that these clinical tests, these clinical evaluations, could not have told the doctor. And so what she said, first of all, allowed her to be more creative in, in her treatment. The second thing is she said, I wish I had known this, because I actually like to be really upfront so that my patients can mentally and financially prepare. Sometimes you can get multi-cycle packages, things like that, if you have the clarity that it's gonna be a rockier road for you. And so she said, I wish if I had seen her fertile limb result and seen she had so many different biological pathways impacted, some of them which were not obvious to me, I would have managed this patient differently, right? We also have a, a, a patient who we think is a first personalized medicine baby. Um, is pregnant now. She um, failed five cycles. Her physician had really run out. I mean, they were at a dead end. They did a fertile limb, and it showed that her body was immunologically different than the average woman in a way that had been non obvious and had not been on her physician's radar. And so she tried an intervention, which normally she wouldn't have done in such a cookie cutter case, and the woman is pregnant now. And we're very excited about that. That was a really happy story for us that the physician was inspired to try something more creative than they would have normally. Um, so that's important. The second thing is about the, the, the snapshot concept, right? So AMH, for example, which we hear a lot about, um, which is produced by the ovary, and it gives you a sense of how many eggs you have left, right? Um, AMH's sensitivity range is really small, right? So you're fine until you're not, okay? And that's the challenge with AMH, is if you come in and you're on the low side a little bit, what does that mean for three or four or five years from now, right? And if you haven't started your family yet, you're thinking about egg freezing, for example, or you're coming in for your first IVF cycle, right? And in that moment in time, your snapshot says you're fine. But what your snapshot doesn't say is whether you're gonna be not fine faster than the average woman, right? And so what we're finding is that women who have these borderline AMH, or even normal AMH, but they have one of these high risk markers for earlier decline in ovarian reserve, if they're already going through IVF, what their physicians say is, look, today, I know that you're good, good prognosis. But what this genetic test tells me is that you have these risk factors that mean that when you come in, you know, three years from now and you want to make siblings, <laughs> I don't know if we're going to be able to do that for you, so why not be proactive today, make some extra embryos, and you have that security so that when you come back, we know that we have a few more genetic normal embryos in the freezer, for example. Right? So that's how it's different. Interesting. So Dr. Davis, to sort of continue with that line of questioning, I'm wondering if you could tell us whether or not it's pretty common for women or, or men, either one, to have more than one thing that's causing their issues with fertility. Because I feel like I've heard that a lot. I know pretty much every woman I've spoken with who has, has infertility told me at least two causes of hers. And that seems like certainly a, a thing that could be tackled by, by the new testing that we're seeing come out. No, absolutely, and I think that you know that's one of the big challenges to from a clinical standpoint is the sort of the old mantra was that you know you you find the thing that's wrong and you overcome it and that could be a blocked tube or that could be you know ovulation problems and there's so much more to it. I mean, there's a, the sort of holistic approach to care, which incorporates perfectly in what you're saying and what your technology is showing is that you know there's so many different you know competing as well as cumulative um, impact factors that are um, need to be addressed. And so not only just coming up with multiple diagnoses, which, I mean, the, the challenge is that in vitro fertilization started in 1978 in the UK and then came to the US in the early 80s. And so it's a fairly new technology, but it's evolved so much so fast because of this sort of idea of let's look at all the different unknowns, let's look at all the different elements and some of that's the genetic basis of it to, you know, some of it's, you know, diet, it's lifestyle, it's, you know, other influencing factors. 
And so with that, I think the, the most logical thing is to say that it's not just a, a, a diagnosis or it's not just a label. It's not just, oh, we found you have endometriosis, therefore <clears throat> this is your you know, major, your, this is your label. It's more about sort of saying, okay, this is one element that's contributing to this. What are the other elements? And not just what are the elements in, that they're contributing to it, but how do, we, how do we take this whole picture of you and as an individual, as a couple, and say how can we sort of, in a multi-directional approach, uh, make a, a treatment that works for you, that works with you, and that ultimately gets you to your goal. And I think that this, uh, you know, the work that you're doing in Somatics is so great in that respect is that it really opens up a lot of people's mind to that. And I think a lot of physicians are used to the, oh, we, we check the box, so here's the diagnosis, and you know, now we're ready to move forward. This is saying, look, that it, not every lab is correct for every person, not every treatment is correct. And a lot of fertility you know, treatments are fairly similar. <clears throat> you know, a lot of fertility over the years is focused on, well, you either there's sperm present, there's not sperm present, either you, know, you have a, a male factor in, in that a guy has low sperm numbers, or you don't have a male partner, and therefore we just need to get sperm. And then the other side of it was, okay, you either have eggs or you don't. You either ovulate or you don't. And either the egg and the sperm are getting together because the tubes are open, or they're not. It was a very sort of black and white kind of approach, and this is really shedding a lot of insight into that, no, every individual person has a different you know, set of events and set of underlying structural things, genetic things. And what I think is even more fascinating is that as we know more about genetics, Genetics are not a set in stone roadmap. I mean, a lot of genes are either to be turned on and turned off by different things. You know, vitamin D is a, a big steroid hormone in the body that regulates gene expression. And so, you know, it's not, I mean, the genes is sort of a nice you know, element and it's a huge part of it, but then there's lifestyle modifications that can affect the way your genes work, you know, either for better or for worse. And so, I think it's fascinating. I think it's really, a, you know, such a nice addition and it just shows how even the last couple of years, the, what we know and what we understand and what we can do has just gone so quickly ahead and we're just going to be so much even more ahead in a couple of years. Andrea, to sort of go off of that, I know that you've said that infertility is, much, is as much a relationship process as a medical process and if you want to elaborate on that, that would be great. But I'm also wondering, you know, certainly when you find out the cause of your infertility, that can create some ripples in a partnership. You know, if, it, if you're the one who is personally suffering from infertility, you might feel your a constant urge to apologize, as though you have something to apologize for. And if you're the one who has a partner who's suffering from infertility, you know, it's possible that you might feel just a tiny bit of resentment at times creep up. That's a perfectly normal human emotion to feel when, when you're relying on this other person in your relationship. Uh, both of you want children so badly. And so I think I'm just wondering, from your perspective as a relationship expert, how do you deal with, with those types of emotions that can bubble up once you know what the problem is, um, no matter which side of it you're on? Yes, great question. So why I say it's a relationship issue as, as much as it is a medical issue or lifestyle issue is that it affects relationships in the deepest way. Any of us in the room who have been on the fertility or infertility journey know this. It affects the relationship women and men have to our bodies, to ourselves, to our community, to our partners. If we're single, that's a whole other relationship issue. You know, I'm writing about, should you tell your date you've frozen your eggs? Probably not on day one, that's a spoiler alert. Um, but, but not a bad thing to mention when you're, when you're involved. Um, but, you know, there's so many relational issues that inevitably pop up, and even the relationship you have to your community and your friends. Something I recently posted on our fan page on Pregnantish that got a lot of engagement was uh, kind of a funny card that says, oh great, just what I needed, another you know, Facebook pregnancy announcement while I'm infertile. Um, I've learned one of the most um, kind of powerful things that I've tried to embrace is the advice I give to others, which is that you can, you can hold two emotions at once. You can be happy for your friend who announces a pregnancy and sad for yourself. And it's the same if your friend gets engaged and you're single and you kind of want a long-term partnership. We are, we are capable of holding two emotions and it doesn't make us bad friends and we shouldn't feel guilty. So there's also, Karen, a lot of guilt that comes up in relationships, uh, which I know from personal experience, having gone through six years at this point of this journey, um, 
but also there's no roadmap because we've never been through this before and people aren't really as openly talking about it as we wish they were. When I came out of the closet on Facebook a couple months ago, a lot of people private messaged me that they've been going through it too. So now I say, don't judge a Facebook by its cover. So as many, as many, um, as many great announcements as you see, we know it's curated. And even the people who have happy pregnancy announcements, we don't know exactly their journey to get there. We don't know if they've had pregnancy losses and devastating miscarriages. And this is something I know because people didn't know it about me. Um, in terms of a, a dynamic and a partnership, and this goes for you know, gay or heterosexual partnerships, whoever's undergoing the treatment, that person is, most of the time, his or her partner is not going to the clinic as much as the woman going through it. So um, there can be resentment uh, to the person going every day, every other day, every few days to the clinic, spending hours doing the shots, feeling physically, feeling hormonal, all of these things. It's easy to say to your partner, well, you don't understand what I'm going through. And, may, and your partner may not understand because he or she hasn't gone through it. But one thing that's often missing, and I encourage couples to keep communicating through it, because you're both on the journey to parenthood if you both want this goal. And it's, there's no higher value to people sometimes than their families. So you're both on this journey. So one of you, you, are, you both have to honor that and hear each other and support each other and maybe not be each other's main confidant all the time. And I'm sure Dr. Hutner agrees with that, which we'll hear from you soon too. I'm forever going to use the phrase, don't judge a Facebook by its cover. Yes. That is 100%. Yes. Um, next time I see somebody, I'm like, oh, I'm not yeah. that happy. Um, no, I'm kidding. Um, 